Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Spagata BS podcast. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, says in the intro of my video. So if anybody's interested in that, links are in the description. Um, and uh, it's not expected. It's uh, greatly appreciated, though. And uh, I want to do a moment of silence for the person still suffering with uh, intrusive thoughts or anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce your gu- your name for introduce yourself and where you went and what years. Uh, my name is Bobby Cook. I went to Hidden Lake Academy from February of 2002 to May of 2004. Okay. And what do you do you know what led up to that? Can you walk us through that? So I was a generic angsty teen. Um, I'd had some family issues. I bounced back and forth between my mom's house and my aunt and uncle's house. I uh, didn't know who my dad was. I was sent off to traditional preparatory boarding school in Connecticut. I had started to act out skips of classes. I uh, was trying to figure out who my father was, had created some lies to get any sort of piece of information that I could even begin to fathom about who he was, the situation. Uh, my family took me to psychological testing. They took me to a educational consultant as well. Her name was Jean Hegg. She recommended after a psych eval that I needed therapeutic boarding school that had sports and theater activities that would be beneficial for me. And the school that she recommended was HLA or Hidden Lake Academy. Um, come to find out, out of like the 150 kids on campus, like 30 of us were all sent by this one person. Okay. Um, did they transport you or did your parents bring you up there? Walk us through that. So I knew that I was probably going to be transferring schools. Um, from my recollection, I was told I was coming home and just, I was going to be going to school at home. Uh, my family lived in Atlanta. My program was... 80 miles north of Atlanta in a tiny little town called Dahlonega. I was just under the assumption that I was going home uh, to do schooling. We had gotten on to a, or we got into the car, actually. We were driving up, and I was um, kind of aware that we were going for, like, this therapeutic family weekend. We get to the top of the, the driveway, and first thing out the door, a man opened the car door and said, My name is John. Uh, you were here to focus on Adam. You're not here to focus on Adam and Eve, nor are you specifically ever to focus on Adam or Steve. Come with me. We are taking you for a strip search. And my parents just said goodbye to me at that moment, and that was the last I saw of them for four months. Um, it was kind of, they knew that I would react negatively if they had told me where I was going, so they kind of led me to believe differently, but I was not transported. Okay. What was the point of this program? Like, how would you graduate per se? Was it points and levels and seminars? Uh, was it more religious based? What was the, uh, could you describe like the, what the program was about? So Hidden Lake Academy was a uh, spinoff of CEDU, which I know I'm sure you've, you know, met many of survivors that went to CEDU programs. Um, it was founded by na- a man named Rudy Bentz. Rudy used to be one of the directors at CEDU Running Springs in California. And it was also founded by Rudy's wife and a man named a man named uh, Leonard Bucciolato, who was a psychologist in Atlanta that was on the board of a lot of private schools in the area. And he had also served as a psychologist at uh, Trouble Teen Schools in the 70s, specifically one called uh, Anawaki. It's now, I think, referred to as Inner Harbor. Um, the way the program was built was when you got there you were in what we called our peer groups they were just your they were your therapy group but you were in an early stage therapy group and you had to wait until a certain amount of students were on campus to be able to actually have your group come together and you actually start the first steps of the program um 
my group did not come together quick enough, and they actually ended up canceling uh, December and August graduations at that time. There were three graduations a year. They canceled December and August, and they actually extended our program to the longest in school's history. Most students were there 18 months. Ours was a 27-month program. Um, you progressed as a group. There was no individual point systems, anything like that. It was based on the group and their progression. Um, and they had a what they called the element system. So you went through Earth, Water, Wind, Fire, Galaxy, and then if you were a postgraduate school, you were in Universe. Each level brought you different perks. So if you were Earth level, you rarely ever went off campus. If you were uh, water level, you got to go into town like once a weekend and pan for gold, maybe. If you were fire level, you got to go to a movie if the list had enough spots on it from the older groups that had been there. And they gave you small perks here and there. Um, they did the generic part of your therapy programming pro progressing was, you know, your generic uh, three minute phone call to your family a week. You had a visit with your family every couple months, generally in town or on the campus. Uh, after probably, I'd say about 16 months, I was allowed to go or no, it was a year after I was allowed to go home before I was allowed to go home for the first time. Um, and they did a lot of parent workshops where the parents came onto campus and worked with you and your group. Um, but we didn't, we weren't the stereotypical TTI of like the level and point systems. It was just how your group functioned overall. So potentially a few people in that group could fuck it up for everybody and you could be there a lot longer. Is that? Yeah. It? So, and so it depended on your size of your group too, because if your group, if, kids got pulled or kids got sent away to another program or to wilderness and they weren't coming back, your group would dwindle down. And then you might have to be paired with a group that came after you. So you might be put into that group and they might be three months behind you. Okay. And it just, it, as, as you just perfectly stated, it all depended on how the groups themselves functioned and one person could ruin it all because if, um, one person was on punishment and affected the whole group for abilities to do certain things, uh, perks that we had, uh, trips that we were supposed to do as a group. Um, and our punishment system wasn't a timed system. It could go on for as long as they deemed necessary. Okay. How long was the program in general? Like how long or would it vary? So it would vary a little bit. Roughly it was 18 months. Um, my situation was very different than anyone else's there. My groups was we ended up in a 27 month program because the lack of students in our group and the lack of uh, activity and involvement from the group members and how long the admissions process took for some of our members to get there. Now they did have a postgraduate program. I do know one student that was at our program for roughly 54 months. Okay. Um, but tied to our program, it also, you could vary because tied to our program, they had a wilderness program on campus connected to a called Ridge Creek. Let's talk about, so, Let's talk about that. Was, it, was that a thing? Was it required? Uh, and walk us through what, what went down there. So that wasn't required at all. I actually never attended Ridge Creek. Um, Ridge Creek was for the worst of the worst students. And if Ridge Creek couldn't handle you and our program couldn't handle you, the next step or intervention would be a psychiatric hospital called Peachford. And then they would find program placement for you elsewhere. A lot of the times it would be somewhere like Provo Canyon. It would be, um, you know, Casa by the Sea, those kind of programs that they would then recommend later on. Or it would be a program, uh, Swift River was run by our, uh, our former founder. So that was a program you could be sent to. Uh, Academy at Ivy Ridge was another one that you could be sent to because our owner owned that one as well. And so it all really just depended on you as the student. Did, did you see a lot of kids uh, starting there essentially and then getting transferred to other programs? Was was there a lot of that that you saw? Or was it more so like, like I guess my question is like, was it actually people acting up 
in the staff size or was it more they were trying to push as many people as they could to other more extended worse brutal programs no no in in the staff size it was the children acting up uh our owner was penny pinching okay he wanted every penny that he could get that's why I was um asking. yeah yeah i mean no he wanted every dime and you know when i was there our tuition was roughly seven to ten grand and this you're talking this is I was sent there in 2002, so 21 years ago, going on 22 years ago. Um, seven to ten grand was a lot different than what it is now. Yeah, yeah. And that was a very expensive program. And then you're talking that a bottle of shampoo would cost your parents 20 or 30 bucks. A bottle of Swab body wash would be outrageous prices. And he was profiting off of all of it. Um, yes. And then he would find shortcuts if you were on punishment you had a different meal than everyone else had. You had a molded grilled cheese, or not even a molded grilled cheese, you had a molded cheese sandwich. And a cooler of water with some powdered Gatorade in it, maybe if you were lucky as a meal. Yeah. He found every loophole to the point where when the school closed and it finally shut down, and this is after years of a class action lawsuit, um, staff members on the property said their checks had been bouncing for six months. When the school shut down, after the class action lawsuit and it folded, um, he had a slap on the wrist of, I think, $400,000 was what the class action settlement was. There was, and, and, you know, you're talking 150 kids on the campus at one time. He was making well over a million dollars a month. There was a church fund, or chapel fund, because he was trying to build a chapel on our campus, that had run from well before I got there to well, well after I had left that program. That chapel never saw the light of day. Wow. He was embezzling funds, we all believe. Yeah. Um, our academic building burnt down. That building contained all of our financials and psychiatric records as well. All of our high school transcripts, everything. Um, that building burnt down in 2007. Most of us can't even find, uh, with the state, we can't even get a G or we can't even get, sorry, our transcripts. We have to go get a GED because our, um, records don't exist, especially the financials. Yeah. They always, the financials are, because follow the money, right? Yep. Um, okay. Um, so, walk us through your first few days there. How long did it uh, take things to click and for you to realize, like, this place is crazy? It was, it was fucking immediate. Uh, as I said, I pulled up, guy opens the door, he says, you're coming with me for a strip search, you're here to focus on Adam and Eve, or no, sorry, Adam, not Adam and Eve, specifically not Adam and Steve, um, takes me into a bathroom where there's a female staff and him, he says, take off your shirt, hand him my shirt, he says, take off your shorts, hand him my shorts, he goes, drop your boxers, hand me, cup your balls, squat, cough, and jump in a circle. That was my first sign, something was wrong. Immediately, I was just thrown into what we call the lodge, that was our hangout spot before meals and this is a co-ed school so all the kids were intermingling um and immediately you're fed to the wolves you're the new kid and immediately at this program like every other generic high school it was clicks and the way you walked in and presented yourself determined what group you were a part of if you sat next to the fireplace, you were part of what we called the Losers Club. That's where I sat. There was kind of the middle ground group where everyone knew those kids. They were all popular, but they weren't the really popular kids. And in the back of the room, you had three sections of the jocks, the really, really popular artists, musicians, cool kids. And then just the mix of the ultra pretty, good looking group. And you were you were defined immediately. Um, and then my first night in my room, uh, they had initiation. So in my room, my roommate's initiation was you had to wrestle with him. He was a diehard WWE fan and he would take the mattresses off the bed, throw them on the floor and he would jump off the closets and like elbow drop you. Um, they speed dreamed you your first night. They would choke you out. So you almost passed out and then let the euphoria hit. Wait, what? Did um, they it was called a speed dream. They would literally hold you against the wall and they put your hand out their hand up on your neck and choke you until you started to pass out. And they would release right at the right moment. So when you gasp for the air, the euphoria would hit your head. And it was like a psychedelic drug rush almost. 
um, they were having you snort, and this is well before the Tide Pod thing, uh, they were having you snort the blue crystals out of Tides to prove your worth to them. Um, the out Night of, Staff. Out of detergent? Yeah. The, just the blue crystals? Yep. What, what was in the blue crystals? And I mean, that. Nothing. It was, it was just their way of saying prove your worth to us. Okay. Um, the night staff was, uh, you had to ask permission to go to the bathroom at nighttime. You really weren't supposed to leave your room till like 6.15 in the morning for showers, anything like that. Uh, we had a night staff named Nebraska, and I didn't know what his name was, and one of the kids goes, it'd be funny, he goes, Cook, it'd be really funny if you yelled, uh, go Colorado, fuck Nebraska. There's this guy down at the end of the hall, he hates when we all say that. I yelled that out. And the man charged into my room with his little nightstick and proceeded to actually, like, try to, like, beat the shit out of me until I crawled under my desk and slept under my desk that night to avoid him. Yeah. Um, the next day, it was immediate therapy. And we're sitting in a therapy room, and they're looking at a kid in the group, and they say, they said, Bobby, do you have everything you need? And I said, yeah. They said, you have your toothbrushes, everything. And I said, yeah. And one of the guys in my group, he goes, I haven't had a toothbrush, and I've been here three weeks. And I've been asking for one, and my counselor at the time, uh, she said, well, how have you been brushing your teeth? He literally held up his finger, and he said, I just take someone's toothpaste and do this with my finger. You all won't give me one. Um, and immediately, they started handing out folders, and those were your punishment folders. That determined your relative length on punishment. And you could get in trouble for... Not throwing away an apple at night, you could be on a three-day punishment. If you got a snack at night and you didn't throw away the wrapper, you were in punishment. Um, if you looked at someone wrong, if a attractive person walked by and you looked at them, automatically they would give you a folder and they would put you on what they called bands. That meant that if you were a straight male and you found someone attractive and they noticed that you found them attractive, you were no longer allowed to talk to a female for a minimum of one month, unless it was the staff that talked to you. Um, if you were a gay man, or if you were a lesbian, and they knew that, they would put you on bands of the same sex. You were not allowed to talk to members of the same sex. Um, but they also immediately, it was, and this is within my first therapy session on my second day, um, they practiced conversion therapy. Which struck me because our owner was openly gay. Our owner, our owner, one of our founders was openly gay in a relationship, and yet he forced conversion therapy on the students. Well, all of them, or just just the ones that were gay? Just just, the, just those that came in and said that they were of a different sexuality than straight. So, so are, are you bisexual? Okay, okay. So, that, did they do for for you then? Uh, they attempted in ways, so that was how they were going to, um, so for one month I was on bands with all females, I was not allowed to talk to females, uh, the next month I was actually on bands with all males. Interesting. And, um, when you would sit in therapy sessions, they would get really graphic about sexual situations in your sex life. Like you and like rape reenactment type shit? Uh, yeah, they had what they called smushing, so if you were uncomfortable with physical touch, you actually had to, like, hold someone. Um, I, at this time in my program, or, you know, in my life, I had not talked about the sexual abuse that I had experienced in my past. When I related to the staff very shortly after I got there, they had me write a letter to my family. My sexual abuse was never talked about. Immediately, I was um, an addictive personality who had a uh, addictive eating disorder, and um, I had an addiction to human connection. So they would find ways to break human connection for me. My background was never talked about. Um, part of my trauma was not knowing who my father was beyond the sexual abuse was not knowing who my father was. That was never talked about. The abuse that I experienced at the hand of uh, family members was never talked about. It was, you're, you come here, you say that you, you like both men and women. Um, we're going to focus on that. We're going to figure out the way to stop that. 
we're going to make you straight again, and we're going to talk about how you like to eat food too much. And I remember, I think it was my third day, I told them that I had an upset stomach. And I know this is graphic. Uh, they actually made me go downstairs and take a stool sample. And they came back and said, you've been lying to us. The stool sample you gave us did not show signs of diarrhea or a stomach infection. How can you say that your stomach hurt? You're now on punishment. Wow. Did um, what's that? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Um, it was just those little things that you were asking, that you asked about. Like the first day, that's when I started really recognizing the signs of what truly was happening. And then when you got placed on punishment, the reality really smacked you in the face because our punishment was a lot of our staff came from the North Georgia Military College down the road or the Ranger base that was almost connected to our, our property. Um, men in one line, women in the other. You single file, you marched, you were not to speak unless you were spoken to. You had a minimum of an hour to two hours of military uh, calisthenics a day. You were child labor. We were building staircases. We were de the property. We were building ditches, rain diverts. Uh, we were moving telephone poles across the property. And then you would get your cheese sandwich and you would get your cup of lukewarm powdered Gatorade. And that was what you lived off for the day. And that was from the end of school until the end of study hall. You were in your room, lights out, but they made sure that if you were on punishment, the door was open to your bedroom where the hallway light sprayed in and hit all of our eyes so we couldn't sleep at night to sleep deprive us. Um, and then weekends, it was from the moment you woke up until the day ended that you were on this punishment and they would just leave you there for however long they determined. And as I said, it was just child labor and that's when reality really smacked all of us, I think. Um, were you adopted? No, I was, I was not adopted. Uh, my mother, my mother, uh, had just been going through some financial issues, uh, loss of a home was not in a good spot. And my aunt and uncle, her aunt and uncle, my great aunt and uncle actually took guardianship of me. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say, I'm sorry for the sexual abuse. I got raped at seven. Nothing ever happened to him. I was just curious about if you were adopted because you never met your dad. No, um, my dad and my mom, you know, sadly, and it's not something I'm ashamed of. Um, I got to meet my father finally, and I got to spend four incredible years getting to know him before he passed away. Um, you know, my my family, my situation was kind of a one-night stand. Okay. Um, the different, like, uh, stages, like Earth, Wind, Fire... <clears throat> would you have to vote up for those and like get the approval of your peers or was it whenever they just thought you were ready you got put on that level so it's whenever they thought you were ready and they you knew that they thought you were ready because you would do um you know every every program calls it something different you know it's a seminar or it's a workshop or whatever they call it um and so you would do a workshop that focused on one element of whatever foundation you were working on so if it was like earth element it was the foundation was reconnecting to the earth and reality okay. and that's what your workshop would focus on as you progress the workshops got interestingly very different um your workshops would do things like we had one called the phoenix challenge i remember I think it was your third level. And they would give each child three challenges. And so at this point, we had thought we had found my dad. Um, we had done a DNA test. I found out he wasn't my father. So they had me write a five-page letter to my five-year-old self describing the situation that I was in and my feelings about it and warning myself. Um, I was a very social person, so they made me wear 10 articles of clothing and each article article of clothing i had to take off and describe what click or group that i was trying to be accepted by because i had acceptance issues the last one was i had to go in because confrontation was something i just avoided i had to go and i had to give 10 harder truths and they wrote a couple of them for me and i remember i think it was the moment that i finally a program kind of 
started to break a little bit. Uh, there was a young woman at the program who we flirted with each other. There was never any attraction. Um, at least I thought so. And in front of 150 students and 100 staff members, they made me get down off the stage, walk up to her directly in front of the crowd, look her in the face and say, I was never attracted to you physically, emotionally, or sexually. I never will be. Please stop flirting with me. You were not attracted to me. That breaks someone at 16 years old. That is public humiliation for someone at 16 years old. And the next day, our family came in for the workshop, and I had to do that same thing to my mother in front of the entire school and staff. I had to sit there and publicly humiliate my mother. Yeah, it sounds like a seminar, what they would have us do in the seminars. It kind of sounds like a seminar process to me. Yeah, I mean, it was based off of, you know, all the ideals that had been going around at that time from CDU and Synanon and all that, so. Uh, how many people were there when you got there, and then how many people were there when you left? Like so I'd say there was, I would say there was probably about 100 to about 130 when I got there. When I left, I think we were probably at 100, 115. Okay. And what was the layout of the facility? Was it like cabins and then there was like people in the cabins or was it like each individual building? How was the layout? Of the facility? So we were up in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, when you pulled up the, so when you pulled up the main driveway, uh, you saw all the staff housing. And you saw the isolation cabin. There was a tiny little isolation cabin at the front of the property where they used to isolate children. Um, when I got there, they, were, they weren't using that when I got there. Okay. Um, they had built something behind the property that they were using that for um, at the time. But so it was, it kind of looked like you were pulling up for summer camp. There's this wooden wooden lodge in front of you, and that's where all the kids were eating. There's this gigantic lake, there's mountains, there's forest everywhere. Um, but it was a straight, sh the whole facility was just one straight shot. You had, at the top of the property, you had your cabin in front of you, or the lodge. You had the gymnasium just off to the side of that. And then in a straight line going the opposite direction, you had the counselor's building, and across from that was admissions and academics. And then next to the counselor's building was dorm a which was for the boys and it wasn't like a cabin it was an actual dorm um four beds per room eight showers 20 washers and dryers and a common room and that was for the boys that were about 12 to 16 and then dorm b was for the 16 to 18 year old boys then there was the girls dorm dorm c which was brand new and then just down the hill from that, we had a student center and a tennis court. And then there was a track around the lake that was behind all this. Um, and it was just, as I said, it was just a straight shot. It wasn't, it gave you a summer camp feel, but it, it gave you a very sterilized summer camp feel. Okay. What, did you guys do any schooling there? And if so, what was the schooling like? So schooling was a completely different experience anything i've ever experienced um we had normal classes spanish biology english math um i could say that i took algebra my entire time there i got to college and i failed pre-college algebra three times wow um spanish we sat in a classroom and listened to a radio and joked around we never learned anything um, our liter one of our literature classes, we literally watched uh, the 1970s comic version uh, or the animated version of The Hobbit and then had a discussion about it, and that took a, a semester. Wow. Um, and then during the summer, you had to take classes, and it was like fantasy literature or um, a lot of Lord of the Rings, again. That was a big thing on our campus. Um, I remember a social studies class, our social studies, we watched the film version of Les Mis with Liam Neeson, we discussed it, and then we watched Pink Floyd's The Wall for a social studies class. 
Well, at least you got to watch Pink Floyd, something Pink Floyd. There's that was a that was a really weird thing about them because we had to, part of our schooling and everything was uh, addictions and drug courses. Very interesting choice in movie though. Oh, well, and that, that's what I was getting to. It was really weird. So they were, we were not allowed to talk about drugs. We could not make drug references. But they would put you into what they called ESA, which was our addictions classroom. And at you had 12-year-olds sitting in that classroom watching uh, Train Spotting, Requiem for a Dream, Bright Lights, Big City, Basketball Diaries. I see. Um, you were you were literally watching movies that in ways for a teenager glorified. Yeah, Red 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 itself is fucking heavy material, man. That was heavy for fucking when I saw it. Like my dad made me watch that when I was like ten or eleven. And even at that age I was still like yeah. crazy. Yeah, those were that's what they showed you to say stay away from drugs. And that's what our addictions classes were. Hey, um, the scene at the end of Requiem for a Dream where the dude, get, his arm gets infected and he has to get it cut off, man, that's that's still to my day, like, in my head. Like, that shit's... Yeah, and for, some of, for some of us, it stuck with us, but for some kids, you know, I, th- I think, what was one of the other movies they showed us? Uh, they sh- we watched Training Day for drug addiction. Wow. Um, but then, at the same time, we were all teenagers that were uh, being elected to go to AA and NA. Whether or not you so, had an addiction, right? Yeah, so I went to AA. I went to AA because I had drank twice before I had been to program. So you're an addict, yeah. Of course. Yep. So I was an AA, I was an AA every Wednesday night. How, um, a lot of t- how they, I wonder how they dictate, dictate these things. Like, oh, he's an addict. Like, is it just like, you know? Because it, it must just be, oh, so, he looks like it, you know? And it's the stupidest. We, we, don't, we don't know. We've never really found out that process. Um, all we know is, is that the man that was diagnosing us, our drug addictions counselor, because um, like so many other programs that have existed, a lot of our staff was not certified or licensed. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what percentage of... The people there, do you feel, were actually certified? Uh, well, so specifically our drug addictions counselor, um, he lost his license to operate as a drug addictions counselor in 1992 in the state of Washington for abuse of medications. Okay. He was not licensed to be running that, and 12 years later, or 10 years later, a decade later, he is still practicing at this program. Um, a lot of our staff members had gotten online degrees in Canada and come down to our program. And a lot of our therapists, <clears throat> especially the younger ones, uh, they were fresh out of college and this was their first actual interaction in working with clients. Our nurse was not licensed, nor was she certified to be giving out medications. Um, there's, I think the psychologist wasn't licensed at the time. Um, there was a heavy influx of people who were not licensed, and there was a lot of teachers who weren't certified. Okay. As far as medication, did they take kids off the medications when they got there, or did they load them up with medications? Because it's either or, I, I generally find. Load. Loaded them up? Oh, they would, they would, lo- they would load them up. Um, I went... When I was like 16 and a half, I had an ingrown toenail, and uh, I was on Percocet for three months because of a ingrown toenail. Um, I had a heartburn, and they put me on Percocet for a heartburn. And it was such a high dose that out of my time there, those are the two periods I don't remember anything. I was a walking, just complacent zombie with the doses they were putting me on. Um... And who, and who was the, the 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 doctor there was prescribing you oxy? Yeah. Oh my god. That's crazy. Yep. Um, it was very rare that you ever went off campus to a hospital. Um. Did you ever see anybody get sent off the facility to a hospital? Uh. Well, so I I know that I went to a hospital for chest pains one time. They took me to the ER. Um, 
beyond that, the only facility that kids generally got sent to that we were aware of was the um, lockdown Peachford, which was the mental health facility. Okay. And on your way, on your way there, you were generally drugged with something. There are numerous accounts of uh, survivors, people that I'm still very close with, that say that they remember pulling up to Peachford, Peachford, and then they woke up three weeks later on a plane going home. What? Uh, let's walk through that. Uh, what did you hear about Peachford? Uh, were they doing lobot? Like, I don't know. Were they doing like sort of like lobot, like electroshock therapy, lobotomy? Like, do you have any sort of no, idea? What kind of no. So Peachford. So okay. Peachford was not doing any of that. Peachford was, we are going to strap you to a table and just medicate you so you're comatose, and you're going to lay there until we decide. So it, it really was just children getting loaded up with stuff and being strapped down to a table and being tube fed and being stuck in a room for weeks at a time staring at a ceiling. So it's like almost like being involuntarily held, like they do that uh, 5150 yes. things in the hospitals, but actually involuntarily held from within a program. Right, and that was a big, big thing for them. Um, the other, the other big thing was if a child disappeared, there was there was only a few reasons. One, they got pulled, which was very rare to ever see that. Um, two was they were sent to wilderness. Three was they were sent to what we called super restrictions. Restrictions was our punishment or child labor. Super restrictions was uh, isolation. You were in a gazebo out in the woods, no matter what the weather was, with a sleeping bag on a concrete pad. One staff member watching, watching you. You bathed in the creek where the sewage runoff met the creek. Um, you were fed military uh, MREs, the meals ready to eat. And you sat out there for 10 to 15 days by yourself with one staff member, not allowed to talk. Um, the only other time we ever saw people get sent off anywhere or that a child disappeared, um, and this is the one that stuck with us forever, a young woman uh, attempted suicide. They life flighted her from the property. We were all told that she had died. Fast forward 20 years later, someone found her. She's alive, well, has a family, children, doing great. Um, it was a medical necessity that they took her away. When they took her away, she made it through, and her parents determined that that was not the place for her, and they pulled her. The staff then told us that she had died. What do we know now, like, how she did it? Do we know any of those details or what actually she, happened? Uh, she hung herself. Okay. That's that's um, it, it, it was a, it was a Christmas vacation. Um, she had hung herself um, in one of the rooms. And this is so sickening to me. Uh, the property is now owned by the Catholic Archdiocese of Atlanta. It is a teen. It's a life teen summer retreat and seminary um, in the boys dorm. A young guy had slit his wrists and he started drawing on the wall of, uh, on the walls with blood. They barely put a coat of paint over it to where you could still see, like, the symbols and stuff he drew with the blood. And to this day, you can walk into that room, and it's still there. That's crazy. That's crazy. There, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of suicidal ideology, a lot of attempts. Um, she was the only one that was ever really taken off campus that I knew of from my time period. Um, but as I said, 20 years later, we found out that she was alive and kicking and doing great family, beautiful, happy, healthy person. Um, her parents just saw the darkness that was surrounding her daughter. Um, and, the, and when I say the darkness, it wasn't only just the therapy. It wasn't just the schooling or the punishments. Um, to this day, that's one of the things that stuck out to me the most was I was a theater kid. I wanted to do theater. We did the the one and only theater production that our school put on. Um, we did have like a traveling group come through and we did like a presentation of Little Red Riding Hood for the town. But we had a uh, presentation or a theater show called Dark of the Moon. And it was set in 1800s West Virginia and it was about a witch who fell in love with a human woman. He gets turned into a male human and the only stipulation is, is that if she ever cheats on him, 
he will forget about her. They have a child. The baby is deformed. The town burns the baby at the stake. They then gang rape the woman in the church. And that was considered cheating because she had had sex with someone else. She dies. He turns back into a witch and never remembers who she is. That's fucking dark shit to handle for anyone. And they're simulating a gang rape on stage. Yeah. At a therapeutic, at a a program that says they're there for therapeutic benefits where students have had sexual abuse. And they have experienced those kind of things and the program's promoting it. Well, yeah, they're they're trying to break you down. They're not trying to help you. you Um, What do you say? You say break them down. Um, Our school was known for not so much the males, but the females. Um, A friend of mine graduated. She was there before me. She graduated after me. She turned 18, she left the campus, and she actually moved in with three male staff members. And she lived with them for quite a few years. That whole grooming thing? Uh Uh-huh. It's pretty pretty fucking common. Uh, Yep. A lot of people tell me the same kind of things. Um, Did you notice, let's talk about that, did you notice any, uh, on the facility when you were there, did you notice any uh, inappropriate grooming between staff? Oh, yes. Uh, Whether it be, okay, let's talk about that. What did you see? Um, So, every... In my in my opinion, every staff had it's gonna be like any high school or whatever, they had their favorites. Um there Favorite. were staff was there that? favoritism. So yeah, so for me, I learned how to play the so called game. Yeah. I knew what staff to suck up to, who's asked to kiss, how to respond. I very rarely got in trouble and I was doing a lot of dumb shit. I very rarely got in trouble to the point where the man that ran our restrictions, our punishment, um, I was getting special trips off campus. To go to a movie, to go to the lake, hang out for a beach day, to go to McDonald's, I would get a special trip. Um, they had a group, and this, this to me was a form of grooming. A lot of people didn't see it like that, but they had a group called STARS. It was the Superlative Therapeutic Recreational or sorry, superlative, therapeutic, academic, and recreational student. Every staff member on the campus had to unanimously vote you in, even the maintenance that that you've never met. And you would get a special privilege. So my first privilege when I made the group was I got to go to a Linkin Park Kubelstein concert. I was not allowed to choose what staff members I wanted to go with me. I was not allowed to choose things like that. It was very specific, and it was um, two female staff members that took me. Hmm. And you would watch how children would interact with each other. And you would see a female staff member take to one guy, and for six months, you would only see interaction between them. And then you would hear that 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 kid graduated and then moved in with that staff member. Or you would see the girls. Uh, the gir- the girls experienced so many more inhumane atrocities than the men ever did. Um, the women at our school were so highly sexualized to the point that one of our athletic directors actually used to stand in the locker room and force them to change in front of him. And those girls would then end up, some of them ended up moving in with him. That's grooming to me. Oh, dude, that's but, cool. there, there's a power that they're holding over those head that convinced these women that he's the only thing that's going to protect them. Yeah. Well, also grooming is just like doing things for somebody, but expecting something in return, but never really. Addressed. And there was there was a lot of that. Um, staff, certain staff, not all of them did it. You'd get a birthday card with like a piece of candy for your birthday from like a specific staff member. Even that's grooming. Right. <laughs> Um, if you were well behaved, um, the staff member that had taken to you would show up with a birthday cake for you. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, um, and the reward and stuff like that. And, and it was simple rewards such as, oh, hey, you did so great in class today. Let me give you a token. And a token for us was when we went to the student center, we could get a piece of candy or a soda. 
And um, they very much would do the whole, let me get a token, but don't use it until I'm there with you. I want to see what you're getting today. I want to see how special this is to you. And then there was a lot of behind the scenes hey, I got this for you, you owe me, we're going to go off in this office over here where there's no cameras. And there was a lot of behind-the-scenes sexual assault and, and rape, and there was a lot of behind-the-scenes consensual sex, too, between staff members and students. Because the staff members at our program were not old. A lot of them were younger. They were fresh out of college. And you're putting a 19, 20-year-old, or they're even in college, and you're putting a 19, 20-year-old around a bunch of 15, 16-year-old females? And just, I mean, it was it was constant. Um, I had a staff member who would take me to hockey games. And I was the only one that got that. After I graduated, um, a couple years later, I moved back to Atlanta and I was bartending. She came and sat at my bar every night, and she would start asking me out on dates. And, oh, remember how nice I was to you when we were there? Wouldn't it be nice if we just went to dinner one night? Hey, I've got tickets to this NBA game. Why don't you come out? I'll buy you drinks even though you're underage. And it was, it was just a perpetual, never-ending thing that I think happened from the, the day the doors opened in 1994 till it shut down in 2011. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let see. Do they have any isolation there? We had the... Before I got there, isolation was in the headmaster's basement. Um, he and his wife were both known to be groomers and predators. Um, they were very open about their sexual lives with the students, and isolation used to happen in the basement of the headmaster's house. Um, it then changed to the isolation cabin at the front of the property, and then changed to super isolation, which was the gazebo out in the woods. Okay. Um, restraint was very well used to get you to isolation. Um, when you see a 300-pound man sit on a 90-pound girl's chest until she turns purple with her arms pinned underneath her and he's laughing. Um, that was a common sight. It was a common sight to see improper restraints led to or used to lead a kid down to the isolation centers. It, it was a very, very common practice for us. What do you think the worst thing that you witnessed there was? And was there anything good that you witnessed there? That's a hard question. Um, I think the hardest thing wasn't necessarily what I saw there. It was the after effects. Um, the rate of the amount of people that we've lost is, I think, in the 16 years the school was operating our list is upwards of 60 or 70 that have passed away. Um, and a lot of them were from my time period, and a lot of them were suicides or intentional overdoses. Um, there were a few accidents, obviously. There was, you know, unavoidable things. But for the most part, there was a large, large rate of suicide and overdose. Um, that just... I mean, it's it's almost like a monthly thing now that we hear that someone passed from something like that again. Um, the physical, the physical and abuse, and the child labor and the sexual abuse was definitely something that I saw a lot of that was horrific. Um, and then the the student on student abuse. Um, I saw I saw a kid get kicked in the stomach repeatedly till he shit himself. They would beat you with socks full of apples and uh, oranges at nighttime if you weren't responding to someone. Um, we had a kid who ran around the dorm uh, with a closet rod and he would beat the ever living shit out of you for no reason. The staff members would beat you and it was just, 
you sleep. I think that was part of the horrificness was you slept at night and you heard people screaming while you slept. And you grew so accustomed to a light being in your face and hearing screaming that it was almost comforting. When you left there, you actually couldn't sleep without that for the first few weeks. The good side of things, I didn't. I don't think there was much good at all. Um, the only good side of things was it led me to having a really close connection and a lifelong friendship with a couple people. And it led me to the anti-TTI movement where I have made some of the most meaningful connections I have ever met and made in my life and made some of the closest friends. And I could not be more thankful for that opportunity, but that's the only good that ever came out of what I saw. And what in that place was for you and how did you deal with it? I'm sorry, you broke up for that first part of the question. Uh, what do you think uh, the hardest part about being there for you was, and how did you deal with it? So the hardest part for me and a lot of students there was is that our homes were less than an hour down the road. And if we went anywhere or we went on a trip, we drove by our house. Um, and being isolated from your family... Uh, which is something that every TTI kid experiences, is the isolation from family and friends and the safety that we felt in certain areas. Um, but I think for me, beyond the abuse that I experienced and things like that, one of the hardest things was knowing that my, my house was right down the road almost. Um, and dealing with it, it was just... The way that I dealt with it was I literally had a little journal and I would I, I literally had a I had a calendar of how many days I knew from day one how many days I had left until I graduated. Um, and we my actual whole group got in trouble because we used to wake up every morning. Our last month there and we would just walk out of the dorm and all the kids were walking up to have breakfast and we would all at one time just scream 29 and that was like hey fuck you all we're out of here in 29 days. And that was our middle finger to everyone, and that was a way that we dealt with it. it was like to rub it in everyone else's face that we were leaving. Um, and you, you know, you found ways to deal with things. Um, I found a creative art lit, outlet in art. Um, I found a creative outlet in reading things that I never would have read before. Um, and. As I said, I made I made a couple of those connections where I probably had some of those meaningful conversations I've ever had with someone. And you just found a way to numb yourself until you got out of there. Okay. Um, let's talk about <clears throat> you're graduating from there and then after the program. Did they tell you that you're going to graduate? Uh, did they have a graduation ceremony? Yeah. And uh, let's start there. So you knew what day you were graduating um and leading up to graduation they would have what they called um life life classes uh you were supposed to talk about finances and how to handle finances you were supposed to talk about uh sex sex and um practicing safe sex we never discussed finances in ours and our safe sex talk was from our male counselor with women in the room, guys, before you have sex with a girl, knock one out real quick because you're going to want to last longer and make sure you wash the area in between your balls and your butthole because some girls like to lick it. And that was our sex ed. Wow. There was no, you know, contraceptives, anything like that. It was just that was it. No financial discussion. Um, we all got an off campus, uh, leading up to the graduation. We all get, you get a group off campus trip and we went, I think we chose whitewater rafting. Um, and then our counselors on the last day snuck us into, cause we had kids under the age of 17. Um, they snuck us into go see bad boys Two as a gift to us. Um, the next day we traveled off campus to an outlet mall and we all bought our graduation outfits. And then you had your graduation ceremony. Um, graduation ceremony was standard. Everyone gave a speech. You walked across the stage. You shook someone's hand. Uh, you, I got two certificates because I was graduating high school and the program. 
Um, you left campus. You went and had a meal with all your your group members or your friends that graduated at the same time as you. And then you were on your merry way. Um, I could say after graduation, I was more destructive and on a worse path than I was before I got there. Um, I think in the six years following my graduation, I stole upwards of 300 grand from my family. I wasn't going to college. I was telling my family, hey, I need money for tuition. I need money for, you know, books. I need money for this. I'd go out to the bar and party or I'd go find drugs. I was lying about everything. Um, I wasn't going to school. I, I, had, I had falsified my graduation and told my family I was graduating college and that I gave my ticket, my uh, college graduation tickets to a, a kid that was in need. Um, I, I fake transcripts. I was on a path of just pure self-destruction. Um, I was sleeping with anyone that walked my way. I was doing drugs. I was partying every night. I was in my head experiencing life for the first time. And reliving what I had missed out on. And I think it was, yeah, I think it was seven years after I was out of program. No, nine years after I was out of program, sorry. Um, or close to that, uh, that my girlfriend at the time got pregnant and I found out that I was having a child and that's when I got my shit together. Um, I was on the path to become one of the casualties. I gave no shit. And I would constantly steal from my family, couch surf, didn't have places to live, went homeless, just did not have a care in the world. All the while, I'm still in contact with all my program staff because I, at that time, wasn't accepting that I had been through something horrific. I was just accepting the fact that I had been in a place that had restricted me because of my parents' views, I needed more structure and... I was thinking, you know, well, obviously I needed that structure there because look what I'm doing now. And it took me almost a decade to realize what I had experienced and what caused me to go on the path I did. Um, I hurt a lot of people. Uh, I hurt myself. And it's regrets that I will live with every day because of what I experienced in program that led me to be the human being I was for a decade afterwards. Did they make you write and sign some sort of life contract? Or like if you didn't act a certain way and do certain things that, that you could get sent back there? No, because I gra I graduated a week before I was 18 and in the state of Georgia at 17, you were a legal adult. So I, I could walk away at any given time. I, mean, I didn't know that at the time, but I could have walked away a year before I graduated. All I had to do was literally just put my shoes on and walk down the road. And I mean, it was a good like 10 mile hike in town, but... Had I made it, I could have found a payphone or someone, and I could have been on my happy way and never looked back. Did your high school diploma actually, because for a lot of people, the credits didn't transfer at all, so is was it even valid? So that's the funny thing, um, and I believe, at, I believe that they didn't. Um, I was in a... I was in a different situation. Uh, the college I went to, my dad was on the board of trustees and he was, uh, his name was on the business school. So my admissions process was very different than other kids that went there. It was like, it was a given that I was going. Um, I have reached out to the state since. I don't have transcripts. But I do have college credits. Not very many, but I do have some. So technically... If I was to move forward with uh, continued edu education, I could without having to get my GED. Okay. Um, have you talked to your parents about like how it, how it felt to be there? And uh, do you think you could ever forgive your parents? My thing is I've forgiven them, but I'm never going to forget what they did to me um, and how it affected me. Where are you with your parents? Um, so it, it's a very different thing. So. Um, after after not having I mean I had contact with them but I was pretty much cut off because of the path I had taken. Um and when I started to get things together, I sat down with them and I said, you know, I need to apologize for the stealing, for the lying, for the things I did. 
Um, and we kind of did this whole conversation of we're going to put the past in the past. And we're going to move forward and we're not going to discuss the past anymore. Um, and then I started getting involved in the anti-TTI movement. I was working with different nonprofits. Um, and things started coming about. Uh, my aunt who sent me, she's very willing to talk with me about it. My sister, who was a part of my process of getting sent, is very willing to talk about it with me. Um, my brother is very willing to talk about it. My biological mother and my grandparents, on the other hand, are a little bit um, less willing to talk about it and discuss those things. Uh, my mother's response was, had I known that they were sending you a place like that, I never would have let it happen. Um, that's all she really says about it. But I realized what I was doing. I take responsibility for my actions. And I realized that like a lot of other parents, they didn't have bad intentions. They didn't, I mean, my great aunt and uncle were, hell, they were in their 60s with a 13-year-old, 14-year-old who was just on a bad path. And they had a psychologist and this certified educational consultant, quote unquote, who was saying this is what your child needs. And they believed that. And then they're getting these updates from the school that are so different than what I'm saying. And they're being told by the school, hey, if your kid says this, they're lying to you. Remember, your child has a problem with lying. They have a history. And so I, it took me a long time to realize that like, I cannot necessarily blame my parents. In the same way that you said it, I will never forget what happened. But I've forgiven them um, for me being sent. And we have since moved on and we have... Now, you know, 20 years later, we have a better relationship, you know, that's very strong and um, that I value a lot, but I held resentment for a decade, a good decade of just pure hatred in my heart. Yeah. <clears throat> Understandably. If you could go back in a time machine and not go through that place, would you do it and why? Um, yes and no. Even though it was so horrific and it was so negative, um, I wouldn't change the person I am today. And again, it led me to so many connections and so many valuable people in my life that I would never give up for anything. Um, some of the friends that I have made because of my experiences there and the people who experienced the same thing that I did that I've been able to work with and, um, just connect with, I would never change that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I would if I would take the experience back just because it made me who I am today, and I'm not. I'm proud of who I am. Okay. Um, let's see. Is it your belief that these schools uh, should or even could be uh, regulated at this point, or do you think that they should all just be shut down? So I truly believe that there is a massive need for mental health care for children and teens. I believe that with all of my my soul um but it has to be proven techniques it has to be regulated at this point in time i don't see a way to get regulation done because every time and this isn't this isn't bashing anyone who's done any legislative work because i did it with the nonprofit i was at for a while um there are so many loopholes and things that no matter how much people fight we're not going to get what we want. And it is my true belief that there are so many politicians and celebrities and people of power that are profiting off of this, that one way or another, they're going to find a way to keep it going no matter what we do. But it's a fight that I'm never going to give up. I do believe that at one day we might be able to see regulation, but it has to be regulation that's never been seen ever. Um... I mean, you know, when you look at, and this is just my opinion, when you look at the overall mental health care regulations and for everyone, they're not where they need to be. Um, there's so much more that could be done and worked on. And this is just a section of that that is a lot larger than people realize it is. But there are great people doing the work to see the change. And I think that one day we might get there. Okay. Um, and uh, is there anything else you want people to know about your story or what 
what do you want people to take from your story? And uh, what would you say to a parent maybe thinking about sending their kid to a program like this? Um, first and foremost, I, to a parent, I would never recommend sending your child away. I think the best thing you can do is find help that's in home or outpatient where you can be with that child and you can sit with them. Um, the other thing I would tell every parent is no matter what your child's going through, if it is trauma, if it, if your child is autistic, if your child is part of the LGBTQ uh, IA community, go to therapy and learn about those things. So you can have a better understanding of who your child is and how to communicate with them more effectively instead of just sending them away and letting someone else handle that for you. Learn, do the research, dive in, work one on one with that child is that something I will always recommend um, because the division of the family and what happens afterwards and the abuse that these kids are experiencing is going to be far more horrific than what they're going to experience at home with you if it's a safe household. Um, from my story, I think it's just, I saw horrific things. Um, I experienced the abuse, but I think that what I would always tell people from my story is that no matter what I go through, no matter if I'm financially broke, no matter where my mental state is, I was able to push through and do something and become someone and that everyone has that ability and that everyone's is, everyone's valuable and I think the other thing that I always learned that I always took away from it was we all may have experienced similar things but we're not all the same person we each one of us sees something through a different lens and no one story is any less important than someone else's we all experience things differently it affects everyone differently and i will never say that i went through something worse than someone else did okay. everyone's everyone has a voice everyone has a story everyone is just as valid as the next all right awesome well thank you so much for coming on the show <clears throat> if you ever want to do part two just let me know and we'll make it happen and if you guys have, if you guys and gals have like uh, like watch so far in the video then please make sure you like the video and share it with your friends and just share 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 and yeah hit the notification bell and thank you so much and we will see you next time bye